Um, so I'm, I'm Rob Niven, CEO and founder of Carbon Zero Technologies. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the use of CO2 in concrete. Um, this is a domain that Carbon Cure operates in and has uh, been pioneering for just about the uh, last seven years. Um, uh, so Carbon Cure, a Canadian clean technology company uh, based out of Halifax. Um, we operate from coast to coast throughout North America with, as I was saying, uh, just about 100 plants now that are operating. Um, we've been listed the last three years as one of the top 100 uh, global clean tech companies by the clean tech group and are also members of the, um, or actually semi-finalists in the Carbon X Prize. The Carbon X Prize is a global challenge right now that's a $20 million purse for the companies that develop the best solutions for using CO2 and turning that into a uh, commodity product. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to follow, follow this, um, uh, this process of the Carbon X Prize. There will be a major announcement to be released on April 9th, uh, where they'll be listing finalists for the Carbon X Prize. And uh, we certainly hope for the best and being able to move on to the next stage. Okay. Uh, so first of all, a bit of a primer about concrete. It's the most abundant man-made material after drinking water. Uh, there's about two tons of concrete made for every person on Earth every year. Massive material flow and, and heavy resource footprint. Uh, one of the main issues with concrete nowadays is its high carbon intensity. By reacting limestone to form cement, which is the powder in concrete, the glue, it forms or it releases a great deal of CO2. In fact, one pound of CO2 is released for just about every pound of cement. Um, considering the size of this industry is, is that leads to a very large carbon intensity. In fact, the cement industry is the largest industrial emitter of CO2 emissions. And this is the challenge that Carbon Cure uh, is working to resolve in partnership with our industry companies. How this is playing out in the marketplace is that due to the high carbon footprint of, uh, of cement, um, concrete industry is, is struggling a bit to maintain its market position within the built environment. Some of the other materials um, are able to uh, position themselves better, uh, whether rightly or, or wrongly, as a more sustainable option. And what we're seeing is as the market is rapidly turning into a green building market, uh, the concrete industry is struggling to, um, to maintain its market share. So the industry has actually put forward a very aggressive plan to reduce its carbon footprint. Uh, it's in line with the two degrees Celsius target by the, um, by the UN and the IEA. But as you can see, is that there's a heavy requirement for carbon capture and utilization as part of their portfolio of technology solutions. In fact, this is about 50% of the total solution. What that works out to is a little over 400 megatons are required each year to be able to meet this, work, to meet this target by the year 2050. There are not a lot of options available for carbon capture and utilization. And just stressing the point that capturing the CO2 alone has no environmental benefit, you have to find a beneficial purpose for that CO2, preferably one that is profitable, uh, is that that leaves very few solutions that are available. And fortunately, Carbon Cure is one of them that at scale, it could theoretically provide 100% of the cement industry's CO2 reduction. Of course, meeting this theoretical limit in time would be a great challenge. So we need a portfolio of solutions within the cement industry that are able to consume CO2 profitably to form a variety of different products. And this concept of using CO2 to manufacture products is, is really the space of carbon tech or CO2 utilization. McKinsey recently wrote a report on the space that was commissioned by the Global CO2 Initiative and they found that this technology space 
it could become, by 2030, a $1 trillion market opportunity capable of producing 7 gigatons of CO2. CO2 can be converted into a range of products, uh, including plastics, fuels, in the case of pond, concrete, cement alternatives, aggregates, chemicals, and the list goes on. It's also recognized as a priority area of innovation for both governments and non-governmental agencies as listed here. I'm extremely proud to say that Canada is probably the world leader in developing CO2 utilization technologies, as well as capture technologies. And this is a great opportunity for Canada to lead the world in not only providing CO2 reduction, but actually developing the businesses that will be able to serve this new global market. Some of the logos of companies are listed on the, on the screen right now. Um, and uh, these, these are uh, technologies that were just randomly selected that create a range of different products. And you'll see the XPRIZE uh, logo as well, which we spoke about earlier, and Mission Innovation. Uh, Carbon Cure is ranked actually as the number one solution globally in this space. Um, we focus on the concrete market, which is also considered the earliest and largest component of that $1 trillion market opportunity. Uh, they expect that it will be valued at just about half of that total, about $400 billion annually. And there's a number of reasons shown on the screen uh, that identify why Carbon Cure was ranked as the number one option. Secondly, uh, or next, is, you know, what is Carbon Cure? Uh, so Carbon Cure is actually a retrofit technology. Uh, I chose the picture on the left here. This is our technology installed at a Ontario concrete plant. Uh, I believe this one is in London. Uh, it's, it's a Lafarge concrete plant. So as you can see, it's concrete that is supplied every single day. If you're building today, you may actually already be receiving Carbon Cure concrete without knowing it. What's, inter or what's important here is that this is a retrofit process that works with existing supply chains and existing production methods. If we are going to scale clean technologies at a time scale that matters uh, for fighting climate change, is it needs to be business models and technologies, I believe, that integrate seamlessly with an existing supply chain. Otherwise, we'll be having to not only displace incumbents, but also rebuild at great cost and great pain entirely new supply chains, which in my mind is not relevant in this climate change discussion. So we, we need uh, retrofit technologies. Uh, and in the case of Carbon Cure, how it works is that we add CO2 into the manufacturing process, which increases the strength of concrete, which allows the concrete producer to reduce it's a uh, cost by using less cement, uh, thereby reducing GHGs even further. We use a SaaS business model, which means that we don't charge any CapEx or we don't charge any upfront cost for producers to adopt the technology. The technology is actually paid for by the savings that we provide to the producer. So it's a real win-win solution that, as we've shown, can be very scalable in Canada, U.S., and beyond. It also provides a marketing opportunity to differentiate your product if you're a concrete producer amongst a very crowded marketplace. As you can see on the picture on the top right is this concrete producer, actually in California, uh, is defining itself by having a lower carbon product. Um, and they've been successful in actually gaining some major projects, such as carbon cures being supplied for the new California high-speed rail line. Uh, there are, like I said, nearly 100 producers uh, across the country, um, with a lot of a lot of growth actually anticipated in Ontario and Alberta um, over the next few months, uh, due to some government action that has been taking place uh, over the last um, last few months that we expect to see a surge in activity. The technology works by adding CO2 to the concrete as it's being mixed. It reacts with calcium to form nanomaterials. That nanomaterial is what provides that high strength benefit. And it's the strength benefit where we see after reducing the cement content uh, of the concrete uh, an enhanced performance that makes the concrete not only stronger, lower cost,
but it also provides a greater safety factor. By having, having fewer failed concrete um, loads, is this allows the producer and the builder to be able to construct with greater safety measure. The CO2 supplied at all the concrete plants that we work at is um, delivered from a variety of different sources. We are agnostic on the source and supply of CO2. Typically, we uh, concrete producers purchase the CO2 from um, large industrial CO2 suppliers. These are companies like Praxair, Air Liquide, Lindy, and they source their CO2 from large emitters such as ethanol, ammonia, and refineries. Um, that CO2 is normally delivered to food and beverage industry, and now it's being provided to carpenter customers in the concrete sector. But we're also very interested in seeing the cement industry supply its own CO2 rather than having to go outside of its supply chain. And for that reason, uh, just last uh, January, we led a global consortium to complete the first fully integrated CO2 capture from a cement plant and reuse in concrete manufacturing. So this integrates the complete supply chain from cement through concrete through construction by reusing the CO2 from one end of um, of the process by beneficiating the final end, which is construction. And just to close on a few, um, few images, uh, these are some of the projects that um, Harvey Cure is very proud of to be working with uh, across North America. This is one that we mentioned earlier, the California High Speed Rail Line uh, is being supplied by Carbon Cure with Outback Materials. Um, this is one of the projects um, in Atlanta, which is a major commercial development. Uh, Ozinga in, in um, Chicago is, is uh, using Carbon Cure Concrete to uh, up, upgrade the University of Chicago facilities, including the library. Uh, here in Toronto, um, Pan Am Games uh, construction for a lot of the events uh, was built with Brampton Bricks masonry products. This is one I'm uh, actually particularly proud of. Uh, this is the um, first construction project in the world to be built with um, concrete manufactured uh, with cement or CO2 supplied from a cement plant. So I was mentioned that project earlier. Well, that CO2 was used uh, to form, uh, this was the first project in the world that was also done in Atlanta with Argos. So these are all very um, interesting projects, um, but carbon cure concrete is also just used for everyday applications such as driveways. Uh, and in this case, this was the first driveway to be poured in, in British Columbia with um, carbon cure and our partner Butler Brothers. Uh, so in effect, this would be the greenest concrete driveway in, in DC. Um, but it just really to show that this product can be used for a variety of different purposes, everything from sidewalks to skyscrapers. Um, and I think that that um, variability allows for technologies to be more scalable and to be able to meet the challenges of climate change by providing flexible, profitable solutions that also reduce CO2 emissions at a globally relevant scale. That's my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I believe that the plan was to uh, ask questions at the end, but I, I'm flexible either way. Our friend was from the, uh, the city of Guelph, and they were asking, uh, how do you uh, ensure that your product could be part of the procurement process for public infrastructure? In other words, is that something that you uh, promote? Uh, are governments saying, uh, these are the characteristics of the cement that we want to be seen uh, uh, in our procurement documents so that it's used? Give us, I don't know if that Sure. Helps. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Yep. Um, there is quite a lot of feedback when I speak, so um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to manage it just by uh, speaking over myself. But uh, I'll answer the question. Is This is actually probably the most important question that could be asked today um, because really the market needs to prioritize uh, technologies or solutions and products like this whenever possible because ultimately that's what leads to uh, the effect that we're all trying to achieve and for Canadian companies to excel. Um, I sit on the federal, uh, on a federal uh, board, um, and this was the, the main recommendation for scaling the clean technology industry was by leveraging private-public procurement. 
So to be specific, uh, you know, this could be something that um, private and public uh, procuring our procurement agents are able to specify every day, uh, as you can see with the infrastructure project in California. And really it's about specifying uh, whether carbon cure specific or you can provide more performance-based language that would regard the use of CO2 in manufacturing concrete. Uh, of course, there's always the risk of some producers that are perhaps um, may, may not be as truthful in their, in their procurement documents or their bid documents, so that's always something to be careful of. Um, but if you are able to include carbon cure by name, um, then it ensures that you don't have a supplier providing a product by name only and not by environmental performance. Certainly, if you have any questions about this, you can send me an email, uh, and I'll be able to provide specification language uh, on how other producers or how other builders are specifying this product. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yuri Lenyanka. And um, I'm going uh, to talk uh, today about a uh, few innovative ideas how to make uh, carbon capture and storage more secure. And um, uh, what is a, a carbon capture and storage? So currently um, our world emits um, uh, more than 30 gigaton per year. So every year we're adding uh, 30 gigaton or billion tons of carbon dioxide. There is no way that we can utilize this huge amount of um, uh, carbon. And so we need to develop, uh, develop new technologies, new ideas how to deal with these uh, additional emissions. And uh, carbon capture and storage is a simple uh, capture uh, carbon dioxide from uh, point sources such as power plants. Uh, compress it to uh, supercritical state to make it uh, liquid or higher density and inject it uh, back underground in geological formations such as um, uh, deep uh, layers of ocean, uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs or uh, saline aquifers. Uh, among these options, um, the only viable uh, uh, one which is considered is um, uh, saline aquifers because um, the ocean uh, has some constraints due to environmental issues and public acceptance. Uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs have a lot of uh, wells which were uh, uh, producing oil and gas in the past and uh, it's subject to CO2 to leak back to the surface. And the, the main problem, of course, for this technology is even in super, supercritical state, is, uh, it, it is less dense than residual fluids. And when you inject it underground, it will try to escape uh, uh, by a few means. You have some natural fractures and abundant wells. And the main technical problem is the risk of leakage. And when you consider the uh, project for uh, carbon capture and storage, what's happening? If you look at this picture, there are a few trapping mechanisms um, uh, after injection. When you immediately, when you inject, um, a few percent, five, ten percent will be dissolved or residually trapped. After a hundred, few hundred years, there will be some chemical reactions which will trap some amount of CO2. But most of the amount of CO2 will uh, stay in the free phase. Free phase means that um, it's available uh, to leak. If you look at this graph, even uh, after uh, 10,000 years, you have a free phase of CO2, which is uh, subject to leakage. And most of the, uh, the carbon capture and storage should rely on the very uh, high quality cup rock um, uh, above this um, um, uh, injected CO2, which will prevent the leakage. And even in the, after uh, uh, thousands of years, you have this problem. And it's very, very difficult to regulate, because who is going to assume the risks after the company who is injecting CO2 is done with injection, let's say 50, 100 years, 
and somebody has to assume uh, the risk of leakage. So uh, in my group, we are developing uh, new technologies, new ideas, how to make this uh, security of this technology uh, uh, more viable, more uh, feasible for uh, regulation and for acceptance. And the risk of leakage depend, depends on a few things. First of all, of the quality of the, your cup rock. So all projects should rely on this cup rock to avoid this leakage. Or another one uh, is the how fast the processes which uh, trap CO2 are happening. And one of the ways to look at this problem to reduce this time. If you uh, uh, invent something which allows us to increase and, uh, and the processes or the rate of these processes of trapping, we will make our carbon capture and storage more secure. This is traditional approach. What's happening? We have some uh, point source, uh, let's say power plant, and we have capture facility which capture this um, carbon dioxide, compress it, and we inject it, uh, let's say, in saline aquifer. During the ejection, you will have this cone of this um, CO2 plume, which is slowly moving up, uh, and after injection, after injection, you can see another picture on the right. So the plume forms the layer of carbon dioxide right above the cup rock. And uh, this uh, free uh, carbon dioxide stays there for thousands of years. So what happens next? So if we uh, let nature take its course, so this uh, carbon free uh, carbon dioxide will be slowly dissolving in the residual brine. And there are a few mechanisms of dissolution, uh, so uh, depending on properties of the reservoir. If we are not lucky, uh, this process will take uh, by uh, uh, diffusion, and uh, let's say after uh, thousands of years, only 10% will be dissolved. If we have convective dissolution, if we have pro um, uh, favorable uh, properties of reservoir, we will have this um, uh, convective structure and the process uh, is going faster. So after 1,000 years, we should expect approximately half of our CO2 uh, to be dissolved. But it's still very, very long time uh, to wait. So if we think a little bit and if we implement some ideas which we suggested approximately 10 years ago, we can take a drill another well or a couple of wells remotely from the injection site, take this brine and inject it back into this CO2 plume. Right? And as far as we have some mixing of fresh brine with CO2 plume, we should expect much higher rate of dissolution. So it's clear that uh, this dissolution can be um, uh, improved, but the question is how quickly and at what cost. So we made some simulations and we showed that uh, this is um, a very approximate uh, theoretical approximation of real situation. With some reasonable, reasonable um, the properties of reservoir, we showed that uh, we can um, uh, dramatically increase the rate of dissolution. Here the lower curve showing that if we do nothing, we inject pure CO2 and wait for nature, we will dissolve the approximately 5-10% for a scale of a few hundred years. When we implement this active engineering, we should be able to dissolve more than half of CO2 within a few hundred years. Right, so it's an uh, improvement compared to um, uh, conventional approach. Then we move further. So why don't we uh, uh, inject not free phase CO2? Why don't we inject already dissolved CO2? So we came up with the idea that um, um, uh, we take uh, brian, uh, pure brian, original brian uh, from aquifer, we have some pipeline in the surface and we um, co-inject CO2 in this uh, pipeline and we dissolve CO2 on the surface before we inject it underground. So by doing so, uh, the uh, CO2 is already trapped and there is no risk of leakage on the surface. So we developed a um, comprehensive um, uh, modeling of the um, uh, so-called ex situ dissolution when we have flow of brine and, and carbon dioxide and pipeline. And we showed that 
uh, this curve shows that the, uh, the size of the initial droplets or bubbles of carbon dioxide to, uh, to uh, evolution of droplet size versus time. And we showed that it's possible to dissolve the carbon dioxide within a few hundred meters of surface pipeline. These two curves represent the uncertainties in the modeling. So because model includes a couple of experimental parameters, which needs to be found from experiment, basically it's mass transfer from droplets of CO2 to the brian. And this is the range of uncertainties. So this is the worst case scenario found in literature. This is the best case scenario. So reality is something between one and two. In any cases, we should be able to dissolve a CO2 within, let's say, one kilometer of pipeline. And basically, it can be done not only on the surface, it can be done in, within injection well. So all of these aquifers which are considered for uh, sequestration are more than one kilometer on depth. So we should be able to dissolve all CO2 within injection well. We don't necessarily need to use a surface a pipeline. What are the, the benefits of uh, this technology? So first of all, uh, uh, this uh, technology eliminates or substantially decreases the risk of leakage of existing um, carbon capture and storage technology. And uh, second of all, it expands dramatically the amount of formations which are available for storage. So traditionally, as I mentioned, you need a very high quality uh, cap, cap rock, high quality cap rock, meaning uh, it's not permeable for uh, leakage. Right? But among them, all aquifers, this is a very small fraction of uh, possible aquifers. If we are dissolving CO2 on the surface or into, into, within injection well, we don't have this constraint of having this high-quality cup rock. We can inject basically in any aquifer which is located uh, below uh, one kilometer depth. So it expands uh, uh, the uh, capacity of this technology very, very dramatically. And the third one, it simplifies uh, the risk, uh, not risk, simplifies the uh, risk management of all of these uh, carbon capture and storage uh, processes. Because, as I told you, if your, um, your project um, is risk for leakage for thousands of years, it's very, very difficult to regulate. Also, there is acknowledgement this work uh, was supported by ANSWER. Uh, and then Carbon Management Canada, a center of excellence. And this is a list of reference. And now I am ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. So this is the, the big problem for implementing carbon capture and storage technology. So um, uh, there are a few uh, commercial scale projects already on the way, like Schleitner project, um, uh, the Weibon project, which is uh, using carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery. And this is one of the requirements to have some uh, uh, mitigation and uh, monitoring uh, technique uh, for uh, all projects. And then and, uh, most of the, uh, what comes uh, in this uh, uh, mitigation plans is um, uh, take um, the measurement on the abundant wells. When you inject, you have some wells in this field, so the most likely it's uh, leaking through these abundant wells. And uh, many technologies are also uh, available, but they are more uh, kind of academically available, not practical ones. Uh, you use satellites to using uh, some uh, sensor or um, uh, surface sensors. You put the sensors on the surface and try to uh, have a baseline before injection and uh, monitor it uh, every maybe month or whatever program is. And um, uh, this is one of the uh, major requirements to regulate this project. If you don't have this um, um, plan in, in, in place, the government uh, or regulators will not allow to do it. Hi, everybody. So uh, our first uh, lecture was uh, 
on carbon capture and utilization. Second lecture was on carbon capture and storage. So now I'm going to talk again about uh, carbon utilization and uh, the kind of carbon utilization which doesn't necessarily involves uh, capture uh, in, in uh, the sense that we need to actually actively separate CO2. Uh, in some cases, uh, we can avoid uh, the separation step. This is what I'm trying uh, to say. Okay. So I'm going to outline uh, some uh, main conversion pathways and uh, to differentiate from the first lecture, here I'm talking about uh, conversion of CO2 into uh, uh, fuels and chemicals, synthetic fuels and chemicals. And uh, uh, so after outlining options, I will focus on thermocatalytic conversion because this is my field of expertise. This is what we are doing in our lab. And I will uh, just very briefly describe uh, two systems uh, for thermocatalytic conversion of CO2. And at the end, uh, I will uh, mention uh, the concept of uh, power to gas and uh, focusing specifically on renewable natural gas which is uh, probably one of the simplest ways uh, to convert the CO2 into synthetic uh, uh, fuel. Okay, so CO2 utilization by conversion. We use a lot of fossil fuels. We will continue using fossil fuels for many decades to go. And uh, I guess this usage uh, will increase, although we are introducing some renewable sources, but the population is growing and uh, at some point, hopefully, we will start reducing the usage of fossil fuels, but I do not believe it will happen in near future. And we are polluting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and uh, some scientists say that actually the so-called global warming is not because of CO2, it's because of sun activity or something else. It might be we are still uh, polluting a lot of carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is definitely a greenhouse gas. And at some point, when we release uh, almost all CO2, all carbon which was stored by plants, uh, by photosynthetic uh, conversion uh, during hundreds of millions of years on our planet, I guess at some point uh, it will cause some kind of natural disaster, most probably, and maybe very soon. So we should be careful, okay? So we can, uh, we can uh, convert with CO2 using uh, electricity and sunlight into synthetic chemical and fuels. Why do we need sunlight and electricity? Because CO2 is a very stable molecule. If you want to convert CO2 into something, we have to put some energy in, okay? We have to break the chemical bond between the carbon and oxygen in the carbon dioxide molecule. And this molecule is extremely stable. It's thermodynamically stable. Uh, that's why it's difficult. Still, we can split water we can uh, get hydrogen, we can react with hydrogen with CO2, and we can make uh, fuels and chemicals. This is the concept, okay? In terms of conversion pathways, we have biological, uh, photocatalytic, electrocatalytic. These three approaches are very good in the sense that we don't need gaseous hydrogen. We don't need to make hydrogen first because we use uh, water as an in to source of hydrogen. Uh, thermocatalytic, uh, we have to make hydrogen first and then to react with hydrogen with carbon dioxide. All these uh, four uh, conversion pathways, uh, they have their own uh, advantages and disadvantages, which I will outline briefly. Uh, for biological, we can achieve very high selectivity. We don't need hydrogen. We have a lot of synthetic pathways. Among these advantages, we have uh, slow CO2 conversion rates because these are biological processes. Biological processes are orders of magnitude uh, slower than uh, chemical processes, okay? And uh, also, it's early development stage, but it's a nice option. Uh, photocatalytic, it's attractive because we can just use sunlight and water, okay? And we can convert CO2 into fuels. So here we have problems, however, of low CO2 solubility and mass transfer limitations as well. In addition, the cost uh, for the cost, the capital investment, and the area for light uh, absorption to provide energy for this conversion will be huge. So I do not believe we can do it on large scale. 
but it could be very good for maybe small to medium scale applications. Electrocatalytic. In electrocatalytic, we can use electricity. If this electricity is renewable or low carbon, it's good. We can convert CO2 into something useful. Similar disadvantages here, uh, low CO2 solubility, mass transfer limitations. Efficiency is not as good. Fradeic efficiency in some cases is good, but overall efficiency of converting electrical energy into uh, the energy of a fuel or into chemical is relatively low. Okay? And we can use it for power to gas as well, by the way. The conditions are mild here, it's aqueous environment, so it's a good approach as well. Thermocatalytic, we have advantages of very fast reaction rates because these processes run at uh, temperatures of hundreds of Celsius, degrees of Celsius, okay, very fast reaction rates. The technology is basically proven because this is how we run our chemical industry, this is how we run our petroleum industry. Of course, for these particular applications, we have to modify it and we have a variety of synthesis pathways and of course there are disadvantages. Selectivity here is relatively low, although with some uh, adjustments, some uh, special catalysts, uh, we can get very nice selectivity as well. There is a problem of catalyst deactivation because we run these processes at very high temperature. So these are harsh conditions. And uh, in terms of production cost uh, point of view, uh, the main disadvantage here, we have to make hydrogen first, okay? There are many pathways for thermocatalytic conversion, and some of them require heat, the endothermic processes, some of them actually are producing a lot of heat, so we can recuperate this heat. And uh, the idea that we can actually start from simple molecules as carbon dioxide, hydrogen, water, methane as well in some cases, and we can build on these uh, simple molecules, which are very abundant in the universe, by the way, we can build basically the entire industry, replacing oil, okay? Of course, it will not happen in the near future, but we can start replacing oil and maybe natural gas as well, uh, slowly, slowly, reducing our consumption of fossil fuels, okay? So we have one option, we can continue the use of fossil fuels, which is basically taking carbon from underground and pumping it into the atmosphere. In this option, what we are doing, we are creating an artificial carbon cycle, okay? We are recycling carbon, uh, the, the most important point here, electricity has to be low carbon footprint, preferably renewable, because you cannot make hydrogen from natural gas and then to use this hydrogen to react with CO2 to make renewable natural gas. You can do it, okay? So electricity has to be renewable, preferably, or at least low carbon footprint. Nuclear electricity is fine. It, of course, we will not build a, a nuclear plant in order to make renewable natural gas, but if it already exists, and if we have a lot of surplus electricity, uh, sometimes instead of selling it down to the United States, we can use this electricity uh, to make synthetic fuels, but we have to do something with global adjustment first, right? So uh, these are the advantages which I, uh, which I outlined already. So we have the benefits of uh, CO2 emission reduction, uh, reduced dependence on oil. We have storage capacity for uh, surplus electricity. And basically what we are doing in this artificial carbon cycle, we are converting CO2 and water into uh, synthetic fuels and chemicals using low carbon footprint or preferably renewable electricity. So now I will outline just briefly two processes which are very simple. That's why I'm focusing on these ones, okay? So it's basically CO2 hydrogenation. This is high temperature has to be above 300 degrees C. And we have reverse water gas shift reaction where we can make synthetic gas. And then we can do fissure tropes or methanol synthesis. Basically, we can replace synthetic gas which uh, we currently produce from fossil natural gas. And also we can make synthetic methane. And of course, methane is not high, high value product, okay? Because natural gas, especially now, it's very cheap. But we are not talking here uh, about competing with natural gas. We are talking here about reducing our carbon dioxide emissions, and of course it will be more expensive, but these costs are going to replacing the usage of fossil natural gas, plus we can use it for peak shaving. We can use it for storing uh, surplus electricity in a chemical fuel. And uh, for this particular action system, uh, one of the main problems is cold formation. It's uh, deposition of carbon on catalyst. Uh, which is one of the major technological problems uh, we have to solve in order to um, 
make uh, these uh, processes commercially available. And there are some developments, in particular in Germany and Europe, but here we are trying to do something Ontario-based, okay? Uh, for process development, there are three key components here. Okay, we need catalyst, we need reactor, and we need system design. Okay, without three co these three components, we cannot build uh, this uh, technology. Uh, catalyst has to be uh, low cost. Uh, everything here has to be low cost because electricity is already pricey. We have to do the production cost as low as possible to make it somehow commercial, okay? It has to be highly active, uh, good stability, of course. So in terms of uh, catalyst development, uh, uh, we are doing uh, a lot of research in this direction in, in our lab, okay? And we are using uh, small-scale, bench-scale uh, catalytic performance evaluation. In terms of reactor design, um, uh, we work uh, right now mainly on the modeling. Modeling is a very good tool because before you go and build uh, pilot plant uh, scale reactor, which is expensive, we can use modeling tools and, and with good understanding of what's happening, we can predict the performance uh, quite nicely. And in terms of system design, uh, in terms of reactor development before, so at the end, of course, we will do also a lab scale proof of concept of different reactor configurations, but it will be very small scale. And then, if, uh, and in parallel, we are doing system design, okay? Because uh, once we have some data from the catalyst and from the reactor, we can actually do some uh, uh, techno-economic evaluation of the entire system. Of course, we are not going to build any system in our lab. This is already uh, pilot plan scale. It has to be field test. It has to be collaboration with industry, hopefully with some uh, money from the government as well. A few words about power to gas. In power to gas, the idea is that we can use renewable electricity or surplus electricity once again. And we can use battery storage, of course. Uh, this is a very uh, valuable option. But it's limited, okay? Because when we store in batteries, if you want to store huge amounts of electricity, you have to build entire buildings of batteries. I, I personally believe batteries is good for microgrids. It's good for small to medium scale storage. But if you want to go large scale, uh, we should go power to gas. Because in power to gas, if you convert electricity into methane, storage capability is practically unlimited. We can use our existing natural gas infrastructure and we can put as much electricity and energy as we want there. It's virtually unlimited. And we can pump it down to the United States as well because North American uh, natural gas grid is connected, okay? Okay, uh, at, the, uh, at the end a few words about renewable natural gas because there is a lot of interest about this particular application recently, including in Ontario, okay? We already know how to make biogas. We can take organic waste. We can make. Uh, we can use anaerobic digesters. We can make biogas. And there are some facilities, some big farms in Ontario, where they actually burn this natural gas, this biogas, sorry, to produce electricity, and they sell this electricity to the grid at very high price because it's subsidized. It's all good, okay? But we can get a little bit more from this biogas. We can actually convert this biogas into renewable natural gas. Okay, biogas is roughly 50-50 CO2 methane. So this 50% of CO2, if we can get cheap electricity or if we can produce renewable electricity on site, we can convert this CO2 into more methane. We can actually double the production of renewable natural gas. And, it, and instead of burning this renewable natural gas uh, to produce electricity, probably it's better to use it for heating. Uh, for industrial uses, because when we burn the methane to produce electricity efficiency is maybe 40%, the rest is dissipated as heat. If we use it for heating, for residential heating for industries, efficiency could be as high as 80%, 90%. Okay, and uh, one last slide. In terms of product, production cost estimation, I'm going to show you just one simple example. Let's look at this methanation system, okay, where we take electricity, water, and landfill gas or biogas, and we produce renewable natural gas and oxygen. And let's just uh, look at the production cost in the simplest form possible. We have CAPEX, OPEX. Uh, OPEX will accumulate with time, of course. It's normalized to the total production of uh, renewable natural gas over time. And if we assume that at some point after, say, five years operation, we paid already CAPEX, so it will be mainly function of OPEX, we can do some assumptions. Bottom line, 
it, it looks like the production cost of renewable natural gas, if we use methanation as opposed to separation of CO2, will be 80% of the cost of electricity in the appropriate units. And this is the last plot I would like to show you. Actually, this is of course the minimum cost, okay? Because in addition, it will be some capex, some additional expenses. So this is assuming that the electricity is the main contributor to the cost. For 10 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, we can get uh, renewable natural gas as cheap as uh, $20 per gigajoule, hopefully. And actually, we've done already calculations based on the entire system, accounting for everything. And it looks like if we are talking about electricity, more expensive with 5 cents per kilowatt hour, 80 to 90 percent of the production cost is actually electricity. We have calculated it based on some real scenario including everything, okay? So bottom line, we need cheap electricity. If we, can, if we can get cheap electricity, if we can get rid of this global adjustment thing, and if we... This technology is available already in Germany. It's pretty commercial, maybe kind of being commercialized, okay? But what we are trying to do here again is to do something Ontario-based. We are not trying to copy their technology. We are developing here new technology. So it looks like it's feasible. Okay, and we have a lot of sources of CO2. I didn't mention, of course, cement industry and steel industry. It's another order of market in terms of CO2 pollution. It will be a little bit more expensive because these ones will require some separation of CO2. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, I guess I will take some questions later. Right? Great, and uh, now we'll ask Peter if you'll make your presentation, and then we'll have uh, a few questions at the end, and then it'll be uh, lunch, so no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> uh, thank you for that introduction, John, and thank you all for, uh, for coming to, uh, to listen to, uh, to the speeches. Um, so my name's Peter Howard. I'm from a company called Pond Technologies. Uh, in terms of what we do and where we are, we're much similar to, much more similar to Robert in the first presentation than I think the other two presentations. We are a, a private company, and what we are looking to do is actually quite simple. We are looking to turn CO2 into revenue. That's about as simple as it gets. So before I get too far into that, I'm going to just talk about a few things that, that seem to be happening in the world and, and how they relate to our company and how they relate to the whole CO2 utilization movement. Um, so first, I'm going to show this slide. This is the number of jurisdictions pricing carbon between 1990 and 2017. So uh, as you can see, it, it continues to go up. There's a big jump in 2005 with the EU ETS, and then there's, there's assorted further and further um, uh, jurisdictions that are doing either a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. Ontario is now included in this. Uh, we have a cap and trade system linked with uh, Quebec and California. And the reason I bring this up is because it's, uh, it can be easy to, uh, uh, to get a little bit depressed uh, about the state of, of uh, climate change regulation with what's happening south of the border. But if you look uh, globally, it's, uh, uh, jurisdictions pricing carbon are increasing, and the number of policies impacting that are increasing as well. The other thing I want to highlight is that clean technology in Canada is actually a massive industry. Uh, it's larger than the aerospace industry, it's larger than the forestry industry, and it's comparable to the oil and gas industry. So not many people know that. Uh, this is some work done by analytic advisors. They're a consulting group out of Ottawa. Um, these are actually 2016 numbers, so they're about two years old now. Um, but clean technology in Canada is uh, about an $11 billion per year in revenue industry. It's uh, growing at about 9%, uh, compound annual great growth rate per year. It has exports of almost $6 billion, and it's responsible for 41,000 direct jobs. So uh, if, you are, if you are looking at clean technology as a field you'd like to get into, or indeed if you are an investor looking to invest, uh, this is really a great field to start looking at. So now, Pond. Uh, where do we? Uh, where, where does Pond fit into that whole picture? So, as I mentioned, and the title of my talk is, is what we do is we take CO2 and we turn it into revenue. So, akin to the last speaker, what we do is, is we don't use any purification or separation technologies. We take what comes directly out of the smokestack of a steel plant, a cement plant, um, a chemical plant, chemical refineries. We take what usually goes up the stack and instead we feed it to our proprietary system. Um, that directly reduces the greenhouse gas emissions of industrial systems and it also provides new revenue for whoever owns the assets doing that. So, that could be the host plant, it could be a third party investor. 
investors, but you get a new, uh, a new revenue stream because what we're taking is taking the CO2, transforming it into something else, and that something else has value. So um, I, I know we've been, uh, some of the other panelists have mentioned um, CO2 sequestration. Um, really what we as a company are trying to do and what the CCS, or the carbon capture and utilization industry is trying to do, is we're not looking to try and make uh, uh, this a government cost in terms of uh, reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, what we're trying to do is find technologies and develop markets and develop the, uh, the infrastructure around that, the, the customers, the investors, uh, the technologies, uh, in order that CO2 is no longer a liability. CO2 is now a profit. So uh, you may, if, uh, if you've been following some of the financial news recently, there's, there's been a few interesting developments recently with regards to shareholder motions. So uh, at the end of last year, uh, Exxon got sideswiped by a shareholder resolution that required them to be much more transparent about not only the CO2 emissions they are responsible for, but also in terms of uh, what Exxon would do in the case of a two degrees Celsius limit on in line with the Paris Accord. So this is a really interesting thing. Uh, Shell just got sideswiped with this last week too. Um, what is the risk? So if you are a financial investor, if you're a member of the financial markets, uh, do you understand fully the risks from climate change to your investments? Uh, if you are a company like Shell, do you really understand what uh, might happen in the case that the world has to go to, uh, to limit its greenhouse gas emissions to uh, limit the temperature rise on the earth to two degrees Celsius, what does that mean for an oil and gas company? So there's some interesting things happening there. Um, but this is how we, part it, we play into that. Uh, we take what usually comes out of the sack and we turn it into the green goo on the right. The green goo on the right is uh, algae. So uh, we take, uh, this is a, a little more of a detailed step, we take um, carbon dioxide that comes out of a smokestack, we run it through uh, our technology, which is a photobioreactor. Inside the photobioreactor, uh, that's sort of a complicated term for a large aquarium, um, really it's a tank full of water with some artificial LED lights in it. Uh, inside that tank, the algae uh, that we use, the algae strains we use, grow. Um, algae are really no different than any other plant. They're no different than a tree or grass or anything you might see outside today. They undertake the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process where you're taking carbon dioxide, water, and light and turning it into sugars, and the plant can then use those sugars as a source of chemical energy to grow. So, you run the carbon dioxide from the smokestack, you put it through our, our photobioreactors, and you end up with algae biomass. Um, now, what can you do with algae biomass? Well, it turns out that algae actually has a fair amount of value. It's another industry that people don't know about, but that, uh, that exists and is about a $30, $30 billion industry right now. So if you've brushed your teeth or um, this morning or if last night you had a beer, um, odds are you used algae. So uh, if you look at the ingredients of your toothpaste, there's something called carrageenan in there. Um, that's, a, that's an algae product. Um, if you, it's also uh, often in beer. So there are, there are many uh, algae products that, you can, uh, that are sold and used right now. So this is how we try to complete that whole story. That whole chain is we take uh, the CO2 in the smokestack exhaust, we grow algae with it, and we turn that into products. And the products that we're working on right now are primarily um, uh, food and food additives if the source of CO2 is clean and free of heavy metals, um, or if we have to filter those out, we're really looking at animal feeds. But really algae, the markets for algae are food, feed, and fuels. These are some uh, pictures of our technology progression. So Pond is actually about eight years old. Uh, we started in 2009 was our first funding, and actually uh, uh, through the Ontario government. Thank you, John. Uh, that was uh, our first pilot plant. That's pictured down on the lower, uh, lower left-hand side. Uh, we attached that to a St. Mary's cement plant in St. Mary's, Ontario. We took the, the raw, we, we stuck a pipe into the, the smokestack of the cement uh, plant, we took what would normally go up the stack and we started playing around with different algae strains and seeing what would grow. Uh, turned out um, the algae actually grew really well, so we moved to a bigger pilot plant, and that's the picture in the middle, those are 8,000 liter tanks. Um, that started to be not lab scale, so we're still only absorbing, I think that was absorbing um, maybe 500 kilograms of CO2 per year, so we're not making a, a big dent in the, uh, in the global CO2 emissions, but now we're out of the lab scale and we've, we've got a, a pilot plant proving how well this can be done. 
And then on the right, you can see our latest technology development. It's, uh, it's uh, again, at St. Mary's in St. Mary's, Ontario. And uh, that particular pilot plant can do about five tons of CO2 per year in terms of its uh, sequestration ability. So again, it's demonstration scale, but this is the whole system um, actually using smokestack gas and making algae. And you make about uh, one ton of algae for every two tons of CO2 you absorb. So this, uh, we can make a couple tons of algae at, uh, at our demonstration scale plant, which, you know, is actually a fair amount of algae. Uh, we did, we have, uh, the, the title of, of this session is to utilize or to store. Uh, you probably know my bias by now, but I thought I'd throw this slide in there just to, um, I don't know, stir the pot a little. Um, carbon capture and storage is, uh, you requires the right geological formation. Uh, I'm gonna say poor economics because it doesn't really have a payback. So the, uh, the Quest project that I believe was actually canceled uh, required uh, $1.35 billion, uh, had about $41 million in operational expenses per year, and they claimed they'd have $27 million in revenue. Now that revenue was actually purely dependent on carbon price and uh, carbon credits, and I think they assumed that carbon credits would be worth $50 a ton to get to $27 million. But uh, if I'm an investor, and uh, uh, one of the sessions this morning mentioned that the scale of the problem is such that philanthropy and uh, I think uh, government budgets are, uh, are, are not really necessarily going to be the main drivers of this. The main driver of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, in my opinion, has to be uh, private capital has to be investment from pension funds. Um, and that's simply because of the scale of the problem. So in North America alone, there are approximately 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted every year. And uh, that's over about, uh, about 12,000 large final emitters. So uh, there is no philanthropy, and it will be difficult for governments to pay to, to reduce that uh, in a meaningful way. So uh, this needs to be something that comes from private capital. And without serious advances in carbon capture and storage technologies, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, compare that to our algae platform. So we are currently building a commercial plant at Stelco. It's, uh, it's going to be the next phase up. We hope to uh, scale it up about uh, 10 times from the numbers I've listed here. Uh, but essentially, $15 million in capital expenditures is going to be out a million dollars a year to operate it. But it's going to earn about $3.5 million per year in revenue. So that means about a six-year payback. Um, in internal rate of return of over 20%, and that's something that can actually support uh, private sector investment. So our next step is uh, many more commercial plants. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Peter. So we have uh, time for questions just before lunch. And uh, so do we have any questions uh, for either David or uh, Peter? And yes, we do. The city of Guelph, all <laughs> yours. Uh, David, my question is for you. So on one of your diagrams, you showed what appeared to be an agricultural operation uh, providing renewable natural gas, and that was somehow linked into your process. Um, so. Do, have you examined the opportunity for using municipal wastewater treatment plants as a source of that uh, renewable natural gas? So, uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, could be an option as well. I myself, uh, we haven't analyzed this specific case, but uh, there is uh, biogas production there as well. So, uh, I don't have specific numbers because I myself uh, have not analyzed this particular option. But it could be an option. The answer is yes. Basically, we can use this technology for any biogas source. So I can think uh, about landfills definitely, uh, agricultural farms definitely, organic waste, food waste, uh, wastewater treatment plants as well. Everywhere we have biogas. Quick question for Peter. The how sensitive is your capital cost and, of course, then the cost of the product uh, to the concentration of carbon dioxide in the input stream? Uh, so if it's uh, dilute as opposed to more concentrated, that will determine algae growth and your product, obviously, but the size and you have some feel for that? Could you yeah. give us some feel for that? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the question was, is um, how sensitive is the finance, if I can repeat and, and paraphrase here, if, how sensitive are, is the capital cost? And I assume really we're talking about the entire um, financial and the, the financial viability of the project to the CO2 concentration in terms of the gas that is coming out of the industrial host or coming into our bioreactors. Um, so one of the things we learned when we were at St. Mary's Cement was that um, uh, what comes out of a stack is not constant uh, in any way or shape or form. It is not consistent in terms of the amount of particulate matter that's in it. It's not consistent in the terms of the oxides of sulfur or the oxides of nitrogen, nor of CO2. So when we were working on the, with, uh, with St. Mary's Cement, uh, the CO2 concentration would spike up to 30% sometimes, and it would go down as low as about 2%. Um, our algae typically like around 5%, um, but that's actually a really simple challenge to solve. We just uh, blend in air. So air is 400 parts per million. If the CO2 spikes up, we have real-time sensors that just uh, uh, blend it down using air to the, the kind of 5% that the algae like. So um, it, really isn't a, it really isn't a big deal from us. The, the, the bigger deal is if, the, if there's some sort of blending before the smokestack that um, dilutes the CO2, in which case um, it's not all that viable because uh, we do need a certain concentration of CO2 to support the levels of growth that support the financial projections. Thank you, Peter. We have other questions? Uh, great. So this is one uh, question each. Uh, Peter, what would be the number one uh, policy barrier? I oh, know maybe I'll, I'll make that uh, for David. What, what would be the number one financial barrier for your company to be able to expand? What what what's the thing that will unlock that? So the biggest barrier to our expansion is purely financial. Right. So. Um, in Canada, we're very good, and we have a good financial ecosystem for um, mining, for example. We're a global leader in financing mines. Uh, we're less of a leader in understanding innovation, and we're less of a leader in understanding things that aren't mines. So um, when we go to the, uh, uh, the pension funds, they often think we're a little bit early in the technology cycle. When we go to more of the VC types, they often think we're a little bit... Um, uh, they're, not, they're not quite sure how to analyze us because the analysts they have on staff um, aren't sure how to equate what we do to a gold mine. Um, so I think the biggest barrier is, is probably in the financing world and just having the investors in the ecosystem here to, uh, to fund innovation. It's, it, there's, there's much more money and the ecosystem for financing and developing innovation is much more robust in the U.S. Um, that said, I also want us to echo the comments of, of Robert Niven in the, uh, in the first presentation. Canada is a leader in carbon capture and, and utilization. Uh, we were also, uh, along with Carbon Cure, participants in the Carbon X Prize. Uh, we're also semi-finalists in the Carbon X Prize, uh, awaiting the April 9th announcement. Um, that uh, was a global competition that asked for anybody who could take carbon dioxide and turn it into something of value. And of the 25 teams that made it into the semifinals, uh, fully, I believe, seven or eight of them were actually Canadian uh, from Alberta, BC, Quebec, Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. So um, we, despite my, uh, my complaints about the, the financial ecosystem in Canada, um, this particular sector is actually quite well represented and is developing nicely um, as a new sector and a new source of jobs and economic development in Canada. Um, it would still be nice, though, if we had a, a few more funds. Uh, well, let's hope if uh, our Canadian companies are successful that they'll be able to scale up here in Canada and not have to go to and the States. not have to move. And not have to move. And then, David, what would you think is the greatest either technical or economic barrier? I suppose maybe one of the things is the, the, the catalyst. But what would you say is the, the thing that will unlock what, your research and make it practical for the world? So in terms of economic barrier, I believe uh, uh, price of electricity. So uh, for industries uh, who are going to be involved uh, in uh, producing renewable natural gas on large scale, solving uh, actually very big problems, it has to be some kind of regulation so that these large consumers of electricity uh, has to have, uh, have to have a low price for that electricity. 
and uh, it, it has to be something preferably five cents per kilowatt hour final price uh, renewable natural gas producer will pay for that electricity because it will need a lot of electricity in terms of uh, technical barriers uh, so uh, Catalyst is not going to be a huge problem. There are some catalysts, even commercial ones, which work quite well. They still require some fine tuning, but it's not like we need to spend another five years for finding a suitable catalyst. Uh, this one is fine. In terms of system design and reactor design, um, as I said, uh, uh, thermocatalytic conversion is proven technology. This is how we run our petroleum industry, our chemical industry. So it just requires a lot of engineering. And, uh, and that's all. Uh, great, well thank you. And then, um, thanks. And then we actually, we, we actually still have Robert online, which is wonderful. So I'd ask the same question to you, uh, Rob. Uh, you seem to be having some great success, but what would you say is the, the number one either technical, fiscal, or policy uh, issue uh, that if that could be resolved, it would uh, help accelerate your growth. Uh, yeah, thanks, John, and uh, happy to listen a lot as well. I would say that the, the number one option is, is either regulatory or supply chain integration, um, but I'm going to pick supply chain, and what I mean by that is that Individual technologies on their own are, are not going to, or I, I don't believe are going to be able to scale uh, adequately fast enough to be able to have an impact. And what we need to focus on right now is integrating these technologies within supply chains. And that can be physically, but also in partnership, uh, commercial partnerships with uh, global supply chain partners. And I think when we achieve that in a more seamless fashion, we'll really see the scale that's required for this challenge. 